Well, Monty, nice to see you. Um, thank you for um, agreeing to uh, do this uh, do this chat, this online Zoom. Um, we, I'm sure you know Inat Wilf. We, we, uh, she and I spoke uh, a few days ago. Um, she's also a contributor to Sapir, and uh, it was a tremendous success. And so we hope we could replicate that with uh, with you and your uh, the exceptional piece that you wrote in our first in our in our inaugural issue of um, uh, of Sapir. It, Titled Eight Tips for, for, reading about, uh, for Reading About Israel. I guess I should briefly introduce myself. I'm Brett Stevens. I'm most of the time an op ed columnist for, uh, for the New York Times. But in, uh, in this capacity, I'm the editor in chief of uh, Sapir, which you can find on the web at Sapir, S A P I R, sapirjournal.org. Um, and find uh, find our find our our first uh, first issue, which I think is is um, something we're we're very proud of, and we're particularly proud um, for having for having published uh, you, Monty. Now, Monty, I'm going to begin by um, talking about not the piece that you wrote for us now, but something you wrote several years ago. You were for a number of years a correspondent, uh, Jerusalem-based, I think for uh, the Associated, uh, Associated Press. And you wrote a blockbuster story a number of years ago about what you saw as the shortcomings, um, uh, blind spots, and frankly, outright dishonesties of the way in which a major news organization like the AP was, uh, was covering uh, Israel, was covering the conflict, covering, co covering the Palestinian story. Two. So, what I'd, I'd like to ask, maybe first of all, since this is seems you know relevant to this moment, is have things changed, gotten better, or just gotten worse? First of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks for editing a great issue of a very promising new new publication. Uh, that story, which I wrote in 2014, was based on my experiences at the AP between 2006 and the very end of 2011. I was born in Toronto, came here as a teenager, came to Israel as a teenager, worked for local publications, and then got hired by the AP as a local Israeli hire. Um, so I wasn't brought in from abroad or anything like that. I, I'm a Hebrew speaker, and a lot of the work of the foreign press here is done by locals who kind of, uh, you know, report the, the local story. And, I went into the foreign press scene quite naive. I didn't expect to have many problems working for a big US news agency. I've always been on the left side of the Israeli political spectrum and I, I wasn't expecting any problems. And I, I was surprised at what I found that I left quite, quite cynical um, and eventually <laughs> got it off my chest uh, in 2014, which was at the very end of the last serious round of violence in Gaza. I guess. It, worth pointing out that 2014 is a very different era in terms of media critique. It's like, you know, it's like a hundred years ago. It's before the term fake news really comes into, into use. It's before the press is accused of being an enemy of the people by kind of cynical people who are trying to protect themselves from criticism. And I'm, and I'm aware of that. Um, I'm aware of that difference between 2014 and 2021. Uh, at the same time, uh, unfortunately, everything I saw, uh, <laughs> I saw and everything in the piece that I wrote in 2014 is, is completely, completely correct. What I, what I found was that the press in this case was for the most part, and I'm generalizing to some extent, not a curious, knowledgeable observer trying to understand a complicated place, but rather a core that was concerned chiefly with activism and ideology, crafting a story that was gonna resonate uh, for their ideological purposes with their home audience. And that's what I described in those two pieces I wrote in 2014. One Can I ask you about that? So is it laziness or dishonesty or, or just um, a certain kind of uh, point of view? It's, it's, it's a bit of everything. Not everyone in, um, in the scene, in the foreign press scene is an ideologue. Not everyone's a true believer. In my experience, the people crafting the story make many of their decisions for reasons that are ideological and not journalistic. And I gave many concrete examples in both of those essays, all of which um, have held up. Uh, the pieces came quite predictably under 
pretty uh, intense scrutiny after they went viral and there are zero corrections to 8,000 words of investigative reporting uh, on, on, that, on that story. So I think that the, the, the main motives are, are ideological. And what I was seeing a decade ago was really the beginning of something that has really ripened and maybe peaked, although I'm not sure it's the peak now, the, the move of what was once mainstream journalism to something very ideological, the abandonment of old ideals like objectivity, or new ideals like justice and the idea that the press's job is not to explain a complicated story to people far away, but to use the power of the press as a tool for achieving justice. That is a very different game. And of course, justice is subjective. And once you start wielding your power in pursuit of your political ideals, um, you, get into, you get into a lot of trouble and you turn the press into something very different than what it's intended to be. And in response to your, to your question, if things have gotten better or worse, things have gotten much worse. And what I saw bubbling under the surface, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, eight years ago, has burst into the open this month with a wave of, you know, poison and hatred and simplistic judgment uh, aimed at a very small country in, in the Middle East that, you know, that deserves better. One fun, one, one, aspect of the story, uh, I suspect, um, that doesn't get play for quite obvious reasons is fear. Um, about a, a year, perhaps two years ago, I guess it was pre-COVID, there were um, stories coming out of Gaza of large-scale protests against Gazan misrule, um, violent repression uh, by Hamas um, of uh, of of Gazans protesting, not not Israel, uh, not going to the fence, but their own government, and coverage of it was um, dilatory and scarce. And uh, my sense is that that has something to do. Part of the disequilibrium in the coverage is that ultimately Israel is a is a democracy. Uh, the Israeli government officials might occasionally be obnoxious to Western journalists, but I don't know of a single Western journalist who has ever quaked in fear at the thought that he's gonna land in some dark Israeli uh, cell never to be uh, heard from uh, again. Not the same story when you are uh, covering events in uh, Nablus or Hebron or, uh, or, or Gaza, City, uh, Gaza City itself. And I wanna ask this in particular with respect to the story that has been very much on people's minds in the last few weeks, um, Israel's decision to um, first vacate, but then bomb uh, the building in Gaza that housed, um, well, the Associated Press's office is there along with that, with, with those of, of, other, um, of other news organizations. AP has been outspoken in insisting that the building was not, um, was not occupied or used uh, for nefarious purposes by uh, Hamas. What 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 are your thoughts on that on that controversy? Sure. I mean, I feel sometimes bad that uh, so much of the story ends up revolving around the AP, and I think you know the AP was is just one player in the international press. And it's a very important one. It's the world's biggest news organization. But you know they were just unfortunate enough to hire me, which I'm sure they they regret. Uh, but of course, we're just talking about. You know, I'm talking about the AP because that's what I know, uh, but it's part of a much broader, uh, a much broader problem, right? If you look at all the press stories coming out of here, or a lot of international, um, you know, points of interest, you'll see that the press is not only getting things wrong; they're getting them wrong in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because you know what does the AP have to do with Reuters and the Washington Post and BBC and CNN? Why is everyone reporting the same story with the same? You know, angle, and that's because the press exists in a kind of echo chamber of its own making, and ends up making the same the same mistakes. Of course, I followed the uh, you know the, the story in in, uh, in Gaza of the, the bombing of the building. I was dragged right into it because my AP essays from 2014 were immediately resurrected online and went viral again, uh, and I was kind of uh, you know brought brought back into into the story. And I think that you can learn a lot from from that story. Uh, the um, uh, the AP immediately files a news story stating as fact that journalists were the target of the strike and that the goal of the strike was to silence the press. 
And that's an amazing leap to judgment. And it's an amazing attribution of malevolent intent to Israel. I don't think there's anyone in their right mind in 2021 who thinks that bombing a building after evacuating all of the people and giving them time to evacuate the gear silences the press. That's not the way it works in, in 2021. The army came out and said that there were Hamas targets in, in the building. Uh, AP denied it. As far as I can tell from my limited uh, sources in the army, uh, the army had reason, a good reason to believe that there were Hamas targets in the building. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was a good idea to bomb the building, <laughs> but it does mean that they did it for a reason. And probably part of the thinking was that Hamas needed to understand that it could not hide behind rest outfits as it was clearly trying to do. There are several incidents in the last round of Gaza which are reported in my essays in which we know that press organizations working in Gaza um, uh, submitted to Hamas dictates about what to publish and, and not to publish. And I'll just give you one relevant example. In 2014, Hamas launched a rocket right outside the AP Bureau, the same building, and um, the whole staff saw it. And at the time, the Western press was generally avoiding the fact, avoiding writing the fact that Hamas was launching from civilian areas which is of course the most salient fact of the entire uh, Gaza conflict. But there was a, a, a discussion inside the AP about whether to report this or not, and they did not. Uh, because according to the Hamas rules of reporting, you, uh, you can't report it. So we know that these organizations submit to Hamas dictates. We know they have um, some kind of arrangement with Hamas. And I think it's important to point out because I think people are imagining that the Western press in Gaza is, you know, Norwegian guys and Americans with vests running around in Gaza, but almost all the work of the foreign press in Gaza is done by Gazans who live under Hamas rule. And these are people who are not gonna cross Hamas. And I completely understand that if I were in their place, I wouldn't cross Hamas either. I don't think we can blame them. And I think we have to understand that this is not a free press. And this so is a- You, you said press. something that I thought was, was interesting just a second ago. Well, many things, but one thing I wanna pick up on you talked about how uh, news organizations, Western news organizations make mistakes in the same way. Uh, examples? Sure, I mean, just drawing on the, you know, on the, recent, on the recent events, if you read news coming out of here from almost any organization, you'll see that they're citing um, the same death toll from Gaza. And the death toll from Gaza is um, given out by the Gaza Health Ministry, which is Hamas. So while the number of fatalities in Gaza might be correct, and is probably correct, more or less, um, the reason for those fatalities is not correct because Hamas has an interest in blurring the line between civilian fatalities and military fatalities, which is why you'll see the number of Palestinians uh, killed in Gaza and not the number of Hamas fighters and Palestinian civilians killed in Gaza. Um, the death toll obscures the, 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 death, uh, the deaths in Gaza that are caused by Hamas munitions. So we have a number from Gaza, but we don't know what that number is. And the press across the board not only cites that number, but makes it the center of the coverage. So the, the coverage of these rounds in Gaza is driven by the number of fatalities in Gaza, which is given out by Hamas. And Hamas knows how this works. They get the Western press. They know the story that they want. They know what intimidation is necessary and when no intimidation is necessary. Because the truth is, as we know, Brett, when reporters want to get around intimidation, they can. When they really want to report a story, they find a way. But in this case, the intimidation dovetails with the story that most people want anyway, which is a story about uh, Israeli strength and Palestinian weakness. The story has really been reduced to a kind of uh, simplified binary in which uh, strong people are oppressing weak people and anything that complicates that is best ignored. Well, one, one uh, other um, asymmetry in, in the nature of the coverage that at least I have noticed is that when um, Palestinian voices are quoted um, uh, by Western news sources, they tend to sing more or less from the same song sheet, right? There's, there's a consistent uh, line, at least on all the big questions. Everyone knows there are factional uh, and, and other divisions, but the truth about Palestinian society is that it's um, highly uh, or much more complex than you would imagine given what people are prepared to say to the press. On the Israeli side, by contrast, that's, that's not exactly uh, the case, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's not just the old uh, cliche about two Jews, uh, uh, three opinions. 
but it's also the fact that it, it can be difficult for a Western reader to understand just who it is they are hearing from when an Israeli is quoted. And I'm trying to, I wish I could remember the source of the story, but in some of the coverage that I um, uh, saw in the last few weeks, um, one person who was quoted and cited as a former speaker of the Israeli Knesset, therefore one would think, uh, an authoritative voice who speaks for a, a, a sizable segment of Israeli public opinion is was um, Avram Berg. Now, uh, Avram Berg, to those who know him, I mean, I'm not make, casting judgments on his views, but he is in effect the Ramsey Clark of, um, I don't know as a Canadian if that means anything to you, but the Ramsey Clark of, um, of Israeli politics. That is to say, he has gone so kind of around the bend in terms of, of his views that he, he, he maybe speaks for, you know, uh, 12 people, half of whom live, live abroad. He, he doesn't see himself as, uh, as Israeli. I don't think he sees himself as an anti-Zionist. And yet this, he was quoted with the presumptive authority of his former position, just as Ramsey Clark had been uh, attorney general in, in the Johnson administration with no hint that he was, um, you know, speaking from, from a very, very different place. This, this raises another question, and, and um, which is not simply how um, Western journalists try to shape the narrative, but the question of whether Israel has any ability to shape its own narrative, or is that just kind of mission impossible, a fool's errand, given the way the press operates and given the fact that it's a free society where, where people obviously have diverse views. What are your thoughts about that? I think that you know one of our strengths has always been that it's an incredibly diverse society, and and, and we have an aggressive you know political mud wrestling you know match going on at all times. And I think it's in many ways more open and more aggressive than than the United States in, in many ways. Um, I think that's been taken to an extreme right now, where we have you know intense political disagreement, political deadlock, a feeling among many Israelis that no one. Is really running the show. We don't have a coherent narrative for ourselves, you know, let alone a coherent narrative that we can, you know, present um, present internationally. The days when you know, Abba Evan, Israel's famous uh, foreign minister, got to stand up in the UN and speak beautifully about you know the Israeli cause. Those, those days are gone. We're confused among ourselves about who we are and what we want, and we're at a moment of intense political crisis at home. So this external crisis, which bleeds into an internal crisis, actually meets our society at at a moment of intense weakness. I mean, I think that we've we've been through worse crises in Israel, but we've never been through a crisis with worse leadership. And, and that's a big, a big difference. It's a reason why many Israelis are pretty depressed at the moment. And it's one reason that we've been unable to form a coherent story about what, what we're doing. What's the goal? What, what do we want to happen? And that's- is, what, you, you said with worse leadership, what, what is missing in the leadership? Uh, the, what's missing is an ability to unify the, the populace, to say, this is our story, we might disagree on a few things, but we are all in the same boat, and here's where we're going. And that is, is crucial, and that's, um, it's not something that our current leaders know how to do, and I think it's not just an Israeli problem, and we're seeing globally that, you know, the, the idea of unity, or the idea of a group of people who can put aside their differences and work together for a common goal, that idea is under fire everywhere. And it's something cosmic about social media and the internet and just the vibe of our times. Uh, but for us in Israel, it's, um, you know, we have no margin of error. America has more margin of error. We don't, if we can't function and if we can't come together and agree on what our military objectives are uh, and agree on how we're gonna survive in a very hostile part of the world, we're, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna get very far. And I think that's the key challenge for Israel, not the external threat, not, not Hamas, the, th the, the challenge is how do we get our act together and, and move forward at a very complicated time. Let me, let me now turn to, to the, the piece itself because you offer um, eight uh, pointers for how an intelligent um, uh, consumer of news uh, ought to um, ought to approach stories uh, uh, in in Western media about um, about uh, 
Israel and, and the conflict. Let's, let's just go through them one by one. Does the source speak the language? Right, so that's a, a, an understanding that I came to when I myself became a foreign correspondent for, for a moment. I, as I said, I was a local hire here. I speak Hebrew and I was kind of a, you know, low on the hierarchy in, in the bureau. And uh, I was sent one day in the summer of 2008 to cover the Russian invasion of the Republic of Georgia. If you remember that episode, the, the Russians invaded Georgia. I walked into the bureau in Jerusalem one morning, kind of, you know, uh, 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 bleary eyed. And the bureau chief said, Matthew, you need to go to Georgia to cover the Russian invasion. And within 24 hours, I was in a Russian army convoy invading Georgia. And I had you no yourself idea. invaded Georgia, yet, yet more occupation by you. I, yes, I invaded Georgia. <laughs> Great place, by the way. If I could invade it, I would. Um, I, um, uh, I couldn't speak the language. I didn't even really understand, I think, that Georgian was a language. I didn't have a map. I didn't speak Russian, of course. I had no business being there, and yet I was covering it for an important news organization. And, and the other reporters who were with me, there was a, a pretty large press contingent. I noticed that no one had any idea what they were doing or what they were talking about. And I, I, I came back to Jerusalem after that and realized that that a similar dynamic was in play in Jerusalem where you know, the bureau chief didn't speak Hebrew and he was taking orders from editors in New York who weren't in, even in Israel. And the story was being dictated according to the demands of people who were very removed. And I think the, the language is a critical, a critical issue. I mean, Americans would not accept an American, but Americans would not accept anyone as an expert on America without English. That's just so obvious that it, off, it doesn't even bear stating, but Americans don't apply that same demand elsewhere. And I think if, you, you know, if you're going to cover China, the, the fact that you have learned Chinese not only means that you can converse with, with Chinese people, it means that you've spent several years thinking about the place. You probably read its literature. You've thought about the processes, you know, the internal mental processes of the place. And then when you appear in China as a correspondent, you'll be able to uh, to see it. And I think that if you kind of come in, like I did in Georgia, or like many correspondents do here, you're much more likely to view it as a very simplified story, mostly um, inspired by your own understanding of your own country. You'll, you'll reflect your own needs and your own preoccupations into this foreign story, which is what Westerners do all the time. Your second point, why are you telling me this? Right, so when I uh, found myself in the press square, I realized that many of the people around, uh, not just the reporters themselves, but people who were feeding us information were, were actually activists. And I realized that the line between journalism and activism had been completely blurred. And it often wasn't clear, you know, if someone was an observer trying to get to the bottom of something or a political actor trying to sway people to toward their political, um, toward their own political, position and, and and how how would you how would you specifically how would you observe this you know, we used to and still true to to this day and um, the, the press treats reports from human rights organizations as news so if there's a report from an organization like human rights watch for example that is treated as not only um true but a news story uh, and it's a key part of the dynamic of the press by the way because a lot of the heavy lifting or a lot of the information is not actually generated by the reporters who, you know, don't have a lot of time and are poorly paid and, uh, you know, are often you know, not very energetic. A lot of the information is coming from NGOs that are you know, quite well funded. And the problem is that these NGOs are political actors and they're trying to create a certain political impression, but the press does not make that clear. It's very clear when a statement comes from the Israeli government, for example, which is clearly a political actor that needs to be treated with suspicion, of course, um, same goes for the Israeli army, you know, you need to take everything the army says with a grain of salt, absolutely, but the press is willing to accept as fact political actors who match the press's own political proclivities. And that's how you get this story that is basically incomprehensible at this point. I think anyone coming into Israel, or probably a lot of international stories, armed with the press story as a map, if you try to see this place with the press story as a guide, the place will make no sense, because the story at this point is so removed from reality that it can't be understood as a description of a real place. It has to be understood as kind of political fantasy for Westerners. So, I mean, that's, that is in fact a bit of a, a phenomenon that I think I can attest extends beyond uh, um, the Israel-Palestinian story. I mean, I remember the 1980s, um, 
every single reporter who went to Japan was there to tell a story, which was, how is Japan such an extraordinary economic powerhouse? How is it that they are taking over the world with their you know, um, brilliant methods of economic organization and industrial organization? And one of the functions, I mean, one of the reasons why this happened is that that narrative actually contained an element of truth, right? And if a reporter landed in Japan, even if he was armed with Japanese and some knowledge of the country, all you had to do was go to Sony and or Honda and see that these were terrific uh, companies that produced uh, world beating products. And you told this story that all fed into the mythology of Japan as number one. It was the title of a, of a book that came out from a Harvard professor in the, in the late 19, 1970s. The problem that you had there was, wasn't that it was untrue, inaccurate, it's that there was another story, another narrative that wasn't being covered. And that other narrative turned out to have more predictive power in terms of where, where the Japan story was heading than the narrative of Japan as number one. If, if some person, not with perhaps a, a background in, in Japanese, but a background in economics, showed up in Tokyo and said, real estate prices here are insane. This is clearly a bubble. He might have been able to, or that reporter might have been able to tell the reader more about the real story of Japan than, uh, uh, than, uh, than the specialist. I don't know why I'm mentioning this, except to say that narrative formation and a certain kind of activist mentality, in the case of Japan, it was a way of showing that American capitalism was decadent, corrupt, disorganized. Um, that too had 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 a political uh, side. So that I, think that, I think that's such, I think that's such a crucial point, and it's not something that's just a, that's just true about Israel. When a narrative is dictated and enforced, it's a it's it's very dangerous. If you're sending journalists to get a particular story, they will get that story. Right? If you you go to any country, you'll be able to pick the facts that you will slot into the pre-existing you know, niches that you've been given in your narrative and you can do it anywhere. You, you know, send me to Russia, I'll get you a story about government repression. Send me to Mexico, I'll get you a story about cartels. You know, send me to India, you know, send me to Saudi Arabia. Just tell me what story you want. I'll be able to get it. It'll be true, right? The facts won't be made up. The, the quotes won't be made up. You can get any story that you, that you want. The question is, do you understand the place? Do you, can you see it? Do you understand the internal drivers of of the place. And I think that here you see a good example of a narrative that's not just kind of catching on, but it's enforced. If you stray from the accepted narrative here, you're going to be out of a job. You're going to be tarred as, you know, a fascist. And, and, and what happens then is that everyone falls into line and the audience for your journalism is completely unable to understand the events because everywhere you turn, you're getting the same narrative. The way the press should work is that you take knowledgeable and responsible people of different inclinations and you unleash them and you tell them nothing. You don't give them any kind of instruction. And then you're, what you're gonna get is, a, is you know, a really confused collection of stories that are gonna contradict each other. And, and it's gonna be confusing and your reader's not gonna get the narrative they expect from Japan or from Mexico or from Israel. But some of those people will be right. Some of those people will be right. And people will realize who those people are and ultimately will be able to understand what's going on in the world, which unfortunately is not the case at the moment. Yeah, it, it reminds me, this is a good story of the great uh, John Burns, who was a, a longtime correspondent for the New York Times. And in the summer of 2000, right before the beginning of the second intifada, when people still so, sort of thought that Arafat and, um, and Ehud Barak, the prime minister at the time, could potentially see their way back to Camp David, back to a lasting accord. He did this story, which the Times, to its great credit, ran on page one, about essentially terrorist training camps popping up through, throughout the West Bank and, and, in, and in Gaza, teaching teenagers you know, how, to, how to build uh, not just Molotov cocktails, but you know, weapons handling, bomb making, and so on. And if you read this story and you realize that these were camps set up by Arafat, it sort of disturbed the narrative that Arafat was a peacemaking moderate who was beset by extremists on his side, right? And, and actually suggested that Arafat was going to be the source of, of problems, as, as it turned out he was just a few, uh, just a few months uh, after that. But looking for the countervailing data 
um, that disturbs that narrative and getting it published is always going to be a challenge. Speaking of which, um, your, your third point, are, um, are you sufficiently suspicious of shocking, uh, shocking images and details? Um, this is important, especially, I mean, you and I are, are writers by trade, but this, is, this goes a long way toward informing what people, what people think. And in this sense, Israel seems to me like it's always going to be on the short end here, because when you have an air force and you can bomb stuff, um, the images of, of rubble are going to invariably have this outsized impact. How, how do you how do you even explain this or get around this issue? It, it's it's a it's a you know it's a question that I think you know people trying to um, explain Israel's case have to have to deal with. And I think it's worth saying also in the, in the context of your previous question that you know, the suffering on the Palestinian side is is real. So you know the the deaths of civilians in Gaza are real and, and heartbreaking. And you can't look at you know pictures of you know kids who've been killed and and you know. You can't look at that without, you know, without having your heart broken. So it's not that it's not that one thing is true and one isn't. It's that you know several different things are going on, and if you are forced to you know jam everything into a political narrative, in this case, Israel is bad and a malevolent actor and shouldn't be doing this and needs to be disciplined or quarantined or something. None of this is none of this makes any sense. It doesn't make sense why people are being killed in Gaza, why buildings are being knocked down in Gaza. Israel's case is complicated, right? We're, we're trying to do something complicated here, which is have a country where you can actually live, you know, where kids can go to school and we want to have hospitals and we want to allow normal life and pave streets. None of that is really at the top of Hamas's list. They have a much more simple plan, which is not connected to progress. They have, you know, a case that can be made by broadcasting a 10 second video of dead civilians. And that, those, those pictures punch you in the stomach. And their heart, you can't breathe after you see them. And logic is forced out of your brain and you know who the bad guy is instinctively. Now I can run around in circles explaining, you know, that there was a Hamas, you know, stash of weapons under that house uh, or that the people were warned or, you know, I can tell you 101 things that the army would say, but that image is so strong that it almost doesn't matter. This is working on feelings, not on facts. There's an example that I give in that piece, which is, you know, war crimes committed by American soldiers it, after the Normandy invasion. American soldiers kill German POWs as they advance into France from Normandy. And if we ever saw videos of that, it would be sickening, right? You know, people lined up getting shot by Americans. People would be shocked by that, but it wouldn't say anything about the justice of the American cause in the Second World War. And it wouldn't say anything about the tactical wisdom of landing at Normandy, right? It's just a shocking detail that should lead us to you know, conclusions about how awful human nature is and how best to manage a military campaign and discipline soldiers who are criminals. But it doesn't say anything necessarily about the broader context in which this violence is taking place. And I think it's something we need to remember as we're pummeled from all sides with shocking images that work on emotions and not on the intellect. The, your next point, what are other countries up to, um, is always a contentious one. And I want you to explore this a little bit because people will often say, well, look what Bashar Assad is doing in, in, in Syria, you know, which is, of course, uh, on a different um, order of, of, of magnitude in terms of, first of all, the sheer quantity of death and destruction and, and the, the, the cruelty with which he has, has tried to, tried to uh, save, his, save his regime. But it's also the case that when you compare Israel to um, uh, to Western countries, like that's that seems to me the the apt and fair comparison, right? So com compare compare Israeli actions in Gaza to 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 the West. Are they uh, are they cause for censure or or you know uh, a different understanding? The the kind of wars that we face in Gaza are you know a terrible kind of warfare. They're not happening on some you know, empty field. In France, they're happening in densely populated areas that are being exploited by, you know, by terrorists on purpose because they realize that a, a country like Israel is going to hesitate before using force in a civilian neighborhood and will be censured for the result, no matter what. That they understand, uh, they understand that, and the Hamas tactic, which is also Hezbollah's tactic, is to make the military landscape indistinguishable from the civilian landscape. 
And we've understood this since the first round at the end of 2008, early 2009, Hamas fighters move dressed in civilian clothes. They're counted in the civilian death toll. The weapons are kept in civilian areas. They're fired from civilian areas. There's no way for a military to distinguish between the military landscape and, and the civilian landscape. And that means civilian casualties, which work I mean, beyond being awful in themselves. They work against Israel and world opinion, as we've seen, and they work in favor of Hamas. They, they engender sympathy for or Hamas. Other Western militaries have been in similar positions. You know, you can think about the Marines in Fallujah, for example, or America in Iraq in, in general, the Americans in Afghanistan, um, the British in, in Iraq. And there have been other conflicts like the British in Northern Ireland and the French are in, in Mali. And there are, there are other conflicts going on that are, um, that are similar. The Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is similar in some ways, some of it happens in civilian Areas. I think Israel's record, again, this is a kind of an awful comparison to make because we're talking about innocent people who've been killed, both in Gaza and in Israel. But Israel's military um, stands up very well compared to the American military. And, you know, if you talk to Americans and ask them how many civilians have been killed by the American military in the past year, I've asked Americans that many, many times just to see what happens. And no one knows. I mean, no one ever knows if it's 50 or, or 5,000. The UN statistics from Afghanistan, I give them in the, in the piece and stuff here, I can't quote them um, yeah, offhand now, but it's over 500 you know, in a year in Afghanistan. And, and there's no comparable moral outrage about that. American drones are all over the place. Um, you know, America projects its power all over the world in, in many, many ways, creating that bubble of safety and prosperity that Americans enjoy. That bubble comes at a steep price. And you know, we can either judge everyone by the same standard or not, but singling out Israel for, for having to fight this kind of war is certainly no, no way to understand you know, the real world that we all have to live in. I'm going to, um, uh, because I'm just mindful of the time and people can read the essay, I'm going to uh, pass over the next, uh, uh, the next four points in your article, just because I want to uh, give uh, the people who are posting questions on our chat function an opportunity uh, an opportunity to, to weigh in. I'll just take a moderator's prerogative to, to choose the question. But my colleague, Felicia Herman, who is, um, who is uh, the uh, managing editor of Sapir, uh, writes, uh, can Mati tell us the story of the trick that the IDF used to sort of kind of imply, but not actually say in a tweet that there was going to be a ground invasion of Gaza, which was then immediately picked up and amplified by the Western press? which it seems like Hamas did as a way to use the press's obvious bias against Hamas to Hamas's immediate military detriment. Any thoughts on that? Probably the, the it's the obvious bias against Israel to Hamas's immediate detriment. Um, that was an episode in this, um, in this war where there was an announcement that, was, that came out in the press that Israeli ground forces had entered Gaza. And up to that point, it had been only the Air Force. Uh, and this seemed to be the next stage of the Israeli operation. And earlier that day, there'd been tanks moving around and it, um, it turned out to be kind of trick that was designed to draw Hamas fighters out into defensive, out of the residential areas of Gaza into defensive positions to greet an Israeli invasion that was in fact not happening. It was just a ruse to allow the Air Force to bomb the defensive positions that were supposed to be manned by Hamas at that at that point, and um, there's some debate about how well that actually worked, but there was more debate afterward about lines of press on purpose, which the army kind of came out and said that it that it had, and there was also some angst in Israel about you know about using the press in in this way. Uh, you know whether these tactics pay off or not is 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 to me a question of military you know effectiveness. If a, if a, if a move like that works and you know, is an effective military move that helps Israel achieve its goals without killing civilians, I have no problem with it. Um, you know, the press doesn't believe- well, Wait, is that, hold on, let me challenge you there, because I, I, I at least have a bit of a problem with it. I mean, it's, it, you know, you can, we, we, we can all agree that the, the, the press's sympathies don't lie with, with Israel and that Israel has a contentious relationship and there are profound problems with the coverage, but this is, this is really kind of, it struck me as really using um, the international media to achieve military aims, which Israel would have been hard pressed to have gotten the honest way, right? Through intelligence and, and uh, you know, signals and, and everything else uh, 
that militaries do to to find find the enemy. And and it's I'm not arguing that you know Israel's the credibility of the Israeli military spokesman has now forever been diminished because it wasn't very high, at least in the eyes of the of the uh, foreign press uh, uh, to to begin with. But that strikes me as it seems to me a line there was crossed in terms of a, appreciating that the press needs to be treated as as a genuine non-combatant in a situation like this and not as an accessory to um, to to Israeli war aims. Yeah, well, I think that's well put. I do think that um, the, the press in many ways is seen as a player here. Yeah. The press has made itself a player. They've chosen a side. And, um, and I think that the army has come to understand it to, an ex to such an extent that you know, the idea that you know, morality and truthfulness is gonna guide their relations with the press, I think that you know, those relations, I think were torched by, you know, maybe not just by the press, but they've been gone for, for a long time. I think you know, whether it's worth, you know, whether the, the press believed the Israeli military before this episode uh, and now does not, allow me to be you know, skeptical. I don't think the press should ever believe the army. I think the, the army lies all the time. That's my you know, assumption as a reporter. And I know it, by the way, you know, um, I know that to be true as someone who has been a soldier and has served in, in the reserves. The army lies all the time, like any big organization, including the press organizations. So you can't take anything at face value. Um, the press you know, reports inside Gaza. So you know, either the Israelis are coming or they're not. And if you report a statement that is vaguely worded, as being true, it's not ideal. But look, this is a this is a full contact sport. Human lives are at stake, and I don't have a lot of patience for the press's pearl clutching in this case, given what I know as an insider. I'm looking for my pearls. <laughs> yeah, let me let me, let me, let me, let me put a different like, question. I wish there were, I had a high, you know, high ideal of what um, of what journalism was supposed to be like going in, and I still do, and I try to maintain it in my own journalistic endeavors, but I'm quite cynical um, when the press, you know, in the case of this announcement or in the case of the bombing of the building, when they get on a moral, you know, high horse and start lecturing everyone about journalistic integrity, come clean about, you know, the way the press cooperates with Hamas in Gaza, and then let's, you know, clean the blackboard and start again. You know, I, I am... This is out of step with, with the order of questions, but my memory was jogged because I think in 2005, maybe six, um, I was in Gaza at, to interview Sami Abu Zuhri, who was then, I believe, the, the spokesman of, of Hamas. And I interviewed him in the same building where the BBC then had its headquarters. It was like a floor away. And ostensibly, that was just an office to conduct an interview. Um, my memory here is, is a little bit uh, unclear. And I actually wrote to a coll former colleague of mine who also participated in the interview. His, his memory was also unclear. But I do remember that Sami Abu Zuhri uh, sat at a desk that he seemed like he owned the joint. So I just, I just add that as a point of, of, of information, but I don't wanna to put too much, um, too much weight into it. There's a very good question here from Daniel Barron. Um, she writes, I appreciate the deep analysis of how mainstream journalism outfits are failing when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you, Danielle. But another huge source of quote unquote information is coming from social media where photos and videos with incendiary commentary are serving as substitutes for journalism and getting tons of traction. We all know social media is a cesspool, correct? But tens of millions of people get their news this way. How connected is the ideological narrative of the mainstream press to social media? Or is the Twitterverse its own distinct beat? And how concerned should we be? Is social media um, so-called influence actual power? Excellent question. Yeah, I'd love to hear actually what you think about that too, Brett. Um, I, I think that what's happened this month is that the internet has kind of entered warp speed and we're in some new social media universe that we don't completely understand yet. And I think Israel is just a symptom of something that's, that's happened. There, there, there will be more, but you can see that the Israel story has now exited the world of politics and media and has entered pop culture. I mean, it's become a pop culture moment. 
model, supermodels, you know, comedians, people commenting on this in the most simplistic and often poisonous way and just, you know, jumping to, to conclusions and assigning malevolence to, you know, to, to one party, almost as if they're talking about every other fashionable cause, climate change, you know, whatever you're supposed to think if you accept that package of views, you know, the cause of, you know, uh, of, of, of the malevolence of Israel has been added to that, that list. I think what's happened is that the, the elite narrative, which is drafted by the, the press and by certain NGOs and by academics and people you know, affiliated with that, with that world, they've created a narrative over the past decade. And I was in at the ground floor. I saw it, I was in the kitchen when this was cooked up. A new story was created to explain what's going on in the little corner of the Middle East that is Israel. And the story is one of Jewish malevolence and Jewish moral blindness. That's, that's the story. Um, the Jews are um, misbehaving, treating people cruelly, and if they could only be better people, or if they could be disciplined or some way, or quarantined in some way, the problem would be would be solved. And the story starts out, you know, small as things do, and becomes harder and harder and harder until we get to a point this month when the story exits the world of the press and is so obvious to every right-thinking person in the liberal world that many people are comfortable, you know, posting. You know about Israeli apartheid on you know stopping your regular feed of pastry you know of being a pastry chef or a yoga instructor and and posting something about Israel and and Palestine and I, I think that um you know it's 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 a scary moment it's a scary moment not just for Israel and not just for Jews but for anyone who has any hope for a rational understanding of of the world that hope gets you know less and less realistic as the social media behemoth picks up steam. Well, I think, I mean, if I, if I can weigh in uh, on the question, you know, I, I think one of, the f one of the kind of defining aspects of our age, which social media um, uh, contributes greatly to is a kind of shallowing of everything, right? Because all information is instantly accessible, there's no need to look for it. Um, and when you do, you tend to follow the first link that pops onto your Apple News feed, um, and then uh, you will read that uh, briefly before there's another link that takes you down another uh, another wormhole. And so there are fewer and fewer opportunities to kind of get in uh, deep. And you were in a sense talking about this. In fact, a very lovely story you wrote recently for Tablet Magazine uh, discusses this in terms of, of Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem, where I lived for a number of years, is an immensely complex city where all kinds of things and all kinds of stories uh, and interactions uh, between the, the religious and the secular, Arabs and Jews, Armenians and so on are happening all the time. And yet we keep, because of the algorithms and the nature of social media, we keep looking for moments that fit into those particular boxes, whether it's a 280 character tweet whether it's an image, whether it's a brief Facebook post, or whether it's something that has immediate um, emotional impact and therefore the virality you need to succeed in terms of, um, of, of social media. And so this, I think, has, has taken a story that was already being shallowed. I'm not sure I've ever used that as a verb, but what the hell, right? You'll, you'll allow it for, for the time being. Shallowed in the sense that there was this kind of simplistic narrative, even back when I, I lived there 20 years ago, between kind of uh, oppressive Israel versus, versus hard done by uh, uh, Palestine. And it's, it's made it more so, right? Um, it's, I think the word you used is accelerate. That's, it's accelerated that, that process. And I'm not quite sure how you reverse that. Presumably, if you were a, uh, you were a tech, if you were Jack Dorsey, right, who, who's founded Twitter or Mark Zuckerberg, you could change algorithms in a way that invited greater depth. But the truth is that people are on Twitter or Facebook already because they've self-selected for quick hits, right? They're not their, their nose is not in Pumpkin Flowers, your, your marvelous book about your experience in, um, um, in, the Lebanon, uh, uh, in the Lebanon war. And I'm not sure there's really an answer to this, 
until collectively this entire country gets so sick of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, that we move culturally in this totally different, um, uh, totally different direction. And I'm not quite sure how that how that goes about. Now let me look for a few more questions. Ah, since since I always feel like Canada gets short shrift, and here we have you as a distinguished Tarantonian. Is that correct? Thank you. Um, Baruch Friedman Cole asks, more than 2,000 Canadian journalists signed a letter calling for more coverage of Israeli power and control of Palestinian society. Is this a call for more nuance or an example of politicization? CBC removed some reporters from coverage because of this letter. Any, uh, I wasn't even aware of this uh, to my chagrin, but any thoughts on this? No, I wasn't, uh, thank you, Robert Cole. I, I wasn't aware of that either, but I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think we're seeing you know, an outbreak of, you know, hatred sweep large sections of the liberal West. That's, um, you know, it's happening inside the press world. It's happening in the academic world. Um, there's a real attempt, I think, to write Jews out of the liberal West through this story about Israel right here in Israel, we're, we're being hit by rockets, which is pretty bad, but it's, you know, at least something you can understand and defend yourself against it. The, the, the weapon being used abroad is a story. It's a very powerful and sophisticated story that's being used to galvanize sentiment against, you know, a racist, colonialist, militaristic, nationalistic, apartheid state called Israel, and all of the people who, who support it, including the co-religionists of the people here. I think it's a, it's a scary moment and it's penetrated the thinking classes in a big way who of course are responsible for generating much of it in, in the first place. And I think that many of us have tried to kind of play ball with that story to some extent as a way of staying in uh, what, we rec what we consider to be the liberal you know, world that we, that we want to be part of. I, don't, I want to be part of the liberal world, I'm a liberal person. And, and I think that we have to be honest about um, our ability to you play ball with um, with a world that tells itself stories, you know, stories of this of this kind. There are letters being signed by academics. There are renewed calls for, you know, for boycotts. There are outbreaks of anti-Semitism, and you know, there are anti-Semitic, um, you know, instances of graffiti, synagogue windows being smashed, death to the Jews being shouted in different places in in Europe. I think we're you know, we're we're witnessing something that is that is scary. I'm not sure exactly where. Uh, where it's going. And I think that's, um, you know, I don't need to take a letter like that at, at face value, you know, as a call for increased scrutiny of, you know, a story that is the most scrutinized story in the world. When I was at the AP, the number of reporters we had covering this story, that was about 40, which was dramatically more than we had covering China. You know, just to give you a sense of the size, right? China's Israel, a small country. Not many of you have heard of it. It yes. is. It's, it's a eight, very small country. It's um, a country of 1.3 billion people. The Israel-Palestine story includes about 13 million people. Israel is a country that is one one hundredth of 1% of, of the world. We had significantly more reporters here than we had there. We had more reporters here than we had in all 50 countries of sub-Saharan Africa combined. So the idea that the problem here is a lack of scrutiny um, is not something that we need to take at face value. I think it's something that we have to understand as part of an outbreak of hatred that's washing over important parts of Western society right now. Mati, um, we have five minutes left and, and I, uh, there are tons of questions. I wish I could have gotten to all of them. I suspect people listening in would gladly have gone uh, a while, but it is a weekday and people have lives uh, to get to. I just wanna ask you something different, which is um, any sources or cause for a sense of Optimism here? Anything that is has has actually improved your your day or your mood? Wow, Brett, that's the hardest question you've asked me all. Uh... I know. I know. Well, you know, the, the the key. I learned over years that the key to satisfying a predominantly Jewish audience is to be as depressing as possible. But um, but I'm going to violate that rule and ask you for for some source of optimism. My, my source of optimism is always just outside my window here in, in Jerusalem, and I have the luxury of not having to, you know, understand this place through stories being told by, you know, by 
by suspect uh, suspects and narrators, I can open my window and go out into the street here in Jerusalem and, and see a country that is deeply, deeply flawed and at a moment of political crisis and failing in, in many ways, but but re remains, you know, remarkably energetic and inspiring place with all of its with all of its problems. And you know, I was just walking around today, just in you know, pretty random parts of Jerusalem, and you come back with your batteries fuller than they were um, before you before you set out. So I do take you know some encouragement from the lives of people here, you know, Jews, Arabs, people who are trying to make it work in a really complicated place, which is most people here on both on both sides. People are trying to make it work. They're going to work. They're coming home. They're trying to make progress slowly. And, and we're, uh, we're poorly served both by the extremists on our side and on the other side who are trying to push us off a cliff. And we're poorly served by kind of simplistic stories uh, that are being told about this place in a lot of the West right now. Mani, I just want to thank you for a wonderful conversation. You're an extraordinary uh, writer. And I'm pleased to say I, 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 I gave a pretty nice review to your wonderful book, Pumpkin Flowers, a few years ago uh, uh, at the Wall Street Journal. Actually, everything you write is, is, is superb. And that was true of the essay you did for us. To those who listened in, I, I just want to thank you. The journal is Sapir, sapirjournal.org. Uh, 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 which is brought to you by the Maimonides Fund um, and by a few very hardworking people who are trying to put out four issues of, um, of interest to um, the Jewish world, um, both in Israel and uh, in the diaspora, uh, in, uh, in ways that we hope will actually bring about real change um, and, and spark uh, spark a, a deeper set of conversations than the one that that you might uh, um, usually have. We do this in collaboration digitally with uh, with Jewish Insider. So please um, keep reading. Um, our next issue, this first issue was uh, about social justice. Our next issue is going to be about power uh, uh, in its various dimensions for, for Jews. Uh, one after that will be about continuity and education and philanthropy, and fourth issue, um, to be determined. So thanks again for, for tuning in. And Mati, thank you so much for your time. Stay well, be well, and let's do this again. All the best. Thank you so much for having me.